Now, let's look at uh, some of the key foundations of mathematics, wherein the basic understanding of sequences, series, equations, expressions, functions, some of these things is what I am typically going to cover here. So, starting off with uh, a quick understanding of the different uh, symbols and rules which we see in the world of uh, uh, basic uh, calculation, we always talk about the term variables. So, when I am talking about uh, 3x, then x is taking different values which is called as variable. Whereas 3 is called as a constant because it cannot change. But generally represented by alphabets, so the x typically denotes a variable, generally denoted in lowercase letters. And when I am combining, uh, com combining the different uh, variables and constants and typically uh, joining them using an addition or subtraction, that is what I am calling as an expression. So, here anything, this is called as one term which combines uh, some number of constants and uh, variables through a multiplication or even each of them in isolation. So, there are two terms in this expression. This two terms put together is called as an expression. So, a combination of different terms. Each one is a term. This is one term. This is one term. So, this is called as an expression which uses variables and constants. And now, if I say y, if I equate this to some variable y or sometimes we denote it as f of x, which means for different values of x, for different values of x, I should get a different output altogether. Right? For different values, I should get uh, a different output. But that doesn't mean that the output has to be entirely different. See, when I am putting x is minus 1, I can get y as 1. Even if I am putting x as 1, still I, I, I can get y as 1. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, this is not a function. Basically, the major uh, requirement of a function is for x equal to minus 1, I can't have two values. It can have either 1 or 2. Then it is not a function. So, for individual values of x, there need to be a unique value of y. Then we are calling it as a function. So, wherever we are pointing the output of an expression to another variable, we are calling it as a function. So, for each input, there should be only one output associated with the function. But inputs wise, if there are more number of inputs rather than only one, means instead of x, y, z, if there are three inputs to a particular function, we call those kind of functions as multivariate functions. For example, the volume of uh, a cuboid takes the length as one, one variable, breadth as one variable, height as one. So, uh, when I am taking all these three independent variables to compute the volume, that is what I am calling as a multivariate function. And in, in uh, not all the cases, all the variables can be allowed for x. In some cases, especially if I am defining a function called square root of x. Now, x cannot be all possible values. I can take square root of 20, I can take square root of 49, but I can't take square root of minus 25. So, the function... For, uh, for what values of the variable the function is really defined is called as the domain of that particular function. So, here I can say that a negative values are not included as a part of the domain of this function. Only non-negative, zero and positive values only 
are the components of the domain of this function f of x equal to square root of x. So we have to clearly define for what values is this function really applicable to. And in general, whenever we are representing a function of this form y equal to ax plus b, we typically call it as a linear function because uh, x is having a degree of 1. But when I am taking it as ax squared plus bx plus c, I call these kind of functions as quadratic functions because the second layer of x, the second power of x is being considered. So in this case, y is called as a dependent variable, x is the independent variable, a and b are treated as constant. Whenever I have an expression of this form, it is nothing but as good as I am taking x and y. On the x-axis and y-axis, I am trying to do a graph. For different values of x, I am trying to plot the different values of y that are coming based on the constants a and b. What I typically see is this point will be 0, comma b wherein it will be on the y-axis uh, corresponding to the point 0 and the slope of this particular line by what extent the y is changing for one unit change in the x. If x is increased from 0 to 1, I see that this y would be increased from b to b plus 1. That is what is the meaning of the slope. So we can very well plot the graph of y equal to ax plus b and it will generally be, it will be a straight line for all linear kind of functions. We find that it is a straight line. And the moment I am changing the a and b, I will get different kinds of lines. I can change A and B and I can get different kinds of graphs. Which means wherever though A and B are constant, they can take different possible values depending on the requirement. That is where we are calling them as parameters. The constant that can be changed to obtain different kinds of expressions and graphs are typically called as parameters. So here, when I use it as a parameter, when the data is changing, when the graph needs to be changed, A and B can get changed. A is called as the slope or the gradient and B is called as the intercept. We have already talked about it. Intercept is a point where the line cuts the y-axis. And slope is the sensitivity of how the y is changing when x is changing. The finance people typically call it as beta because generally this concept is typically used when they are trying to plot the risk, the systemic, uh, systematic risk of the security on the x-axis and the return on the y-axis the graph that comes out looks more or less the same. The slope of it is typically termed as beta. And when any expression is equated to some value and we are trying to solve it, that is what we call as the equation and the solving of the equation. So all these uh, basic terms need to be comfortable for us while doing any kind of numericals moving forward. And lots and lots of Greek letters are being used as a part of uh, different notations. Alpha generally used as the intercept for regression. Beta is used as a slope for regression. Gamma, delta, these are all option sensitivity kind of measures. We also have theta. We also have rho. All these are treated as sensitivities of the option. Means in the financial world, we are using lots of Greek letters which represent the sensitivity of the option with respect to the change in the underlying uh, assets price. Error is generally, when we are doing statistics and any kind of errors that are coming up, uh, especially the forecasting errors, 
any kind of random related variable or random related error we want to represent, we use the Greek letter epsilon for it. And generally, uh, for uh, expected return, we use mu. For any kind of expected returns on the securities or portfolios, we are using the letter mu. To associate the degrees of freedom, we are using the letter nu. We also use a letter called vega, which is also an option sensitivity measure. The pi, again, uh, when we are talking about a capital pi, it is typically uh, used as a multiplier. A multiplication of few values, we denote it by the capital letter pi. Whereas the small letter pi is a clear indication of a constant which is 22 by 7. Similarly, sigma, we have a capital sigma which denotes summation. A small sigma which is generally used for denoting the standard deviation of the data. Rho, we have earlier discussed that it is used as an option sensitivity measure. But it is also used to talk about the coefficient of correlation. Pi is more and more associated with the normal distribution. A capital Pi represents uh, the cumulative normal distribution, whereas a small Pi denotes uh, even a word called null set, or it also talks about the density function associated with the normal distribution. Chi is again a part of a chi-square distribution, which is generally done for goodness of fit. So, a good understanding of uh, the Greek letters, we can even uh, use uh, a lot of other things. Delta is used for a small change in the values. Lots of other Greek letters also have their usage in various applications in finance. So, some amount of basic understanding of these things are required as they contribute more and more to the terminology. Right? Now, just talking about the different types of numbers. We have natural numbers which are called as counting numbers. Only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We don't have uh, negatives. We don't have zeros. We don't have decimals. Only the counting numbers are called as natural numbers. The counting numbers along with zero and the negative counting numbers, if I am taking, they constitute the integers. Again, the decimals are not included in the group of integers. But whenever I am taking the rational numbers, they are denoted by the letter Q. It's always a pair of integers A and B. Always write it in the form of A divided by B. There should be an ending to this. It should not be a continuously recurring uh, kind of uh, division. A divided by B, where B should not be equal to 0. Then I can very well exhibit this kind. I can very well call these kind of numbers as rational numbers. This should be an integer. This should be an integer, positive or negative. But I should, not, I should be able to... Uh, express it in the form of two integers and uh, the denominator cannot be equal to zero. They are called as rational numbers. And if my set also contains the irrational numbers, especially I can't express it in the form of A by B, especially if I am talking about, let's say, square root of two. I cannot exhibit or express this number in the form of A divided by B where A and B are both integers. Because this value is 1.414, I don't know, it cannot end anywhere. If that's the case, we cannot express it in the form of A by B where A and B, both of them are integers. In that case, we call those kind of numbers as irrational numbers. A combination of rational and irrational numbers together is what we are calling as the real numbers which can be represented on the number line. Somewhere or the other, a real number can be represented on the number line. And the opposite of the real number is a complex number, something which is purely imaginary. Sometimes uh, that is also the word that is used for complex numbers. 
it's an imaginary number it is not real it cannot be represented on the number line so that's one one set probably majority of the applications in finance they go with the real number usage itself very rarely we get into the usage of complex numbers and uh, we can add two numbers multiply two numbers using uh, even the fractions something of the form a by b plus p by q we are taking an uh, lcm the lowest common multiple which is working out to bq which works out as aq plus bp divided by bq which works out as the 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 kind of operation addition operation in terms of uh, fractions similarly the multiplication wise we are directly multiplying the numerators and multiplying the denominators and coming out with this properties wise we see when i say a commutative property under addition a plus b should be same as b plus a commutative property under multiplication is a into b should be equal to b into a that is what is the commutative property associative is in whatever way i add a plus b plus c should be same as a plus b plus c even when i change the order and then do the addition the value should come out to be the same that is what is the exhibition of the associate property under addition and even under multiplication there is an association property similarly when i am talking about uh, the identity property in case of addition when i am adding zero to any number it is the same number that i am going to get in case of multiplication i multiply with one i am going to get the same number that is what is the identity property under addition as well as under multiplication then coming out to the distributive when we are talking about a multiplied by b plus c it is as good as a multiplied by b plus a multiplied by c if i am having this kind of expressibility then i am calling it as distributive under multiplication it is not distributive under addition if you see a plus b into c it doesn't go as a plus b into a plus c this is not the typical thing that comes out but under the multiplication a multiplied by b plus c it works out as a multiplied by b plus a multiplied by c separately this is what we call as the distributive property under multiplication so these are some some basic concepts relating to the numbers and their properties that we really need to be comfortable with and whenever we are trying to simplify any kind of calculations it is first we really need to work out with the brackets anywhere given okay let me just uh, quickly take some kind of uh, numbers 5 into 2 plus 3 minus 7 divided by 4 plus 2 into 3 and let's say 4 square so all these things coming up so wherever the brackets are there first solve the bracket okay so this only one bracket is there totally so as a first step i am evaluating the brackets so i am evaluating the brackets so this is becoming 6 now as a next step look at indices so this is the only index that is there so 5 into 2 plus 3 minus 7 divided by 4 squared is 16 plus 6 then go with division so the division is 7 divided by 16 so do that 5 into 2 plus 3 minus 7 divided by 16 whatever is the value so just to correct it to make things easier let me take the value as 8 here so 8 divided by 16 gives me 0.5 plus 6 now again do the multiplication no more divisions are there so take the multiplication 5 into 2 10 plus 3 minus 0.5 plus 6 this is the multiplication then we are looking at additions 
10 plus 3, 13 plus 6, 19 minus 0.5, which is working out to 18.5 being the value out of this addition. So, any kind of uh, simplifications that we need to do, even if the brackets are not provided, we have to really go ahead in terms of using this assumption of bit mass, brackets, indices, division, multiplication, addition, and then subtraction to simplify any kind of expression. Fine. Now, the next important thing that we can uh, look at here is about the sequences and series. Again, a lot of applications, especially uh, the usage of arithmetic progression and geometric progression. And some of uh, n terms in a geometric progression, there are lots of applications in finite. Similarly, some of infinite terms. All these things have some level of uh, application in finance, so better understanding of these things will really be helpful. So, whenever we are using the word sequence, sometimes we use the word progression also for that. It's just an ordered countable set of terms. So, when each of them, there could be a, a sequence which where each term differing by the same value means the first term is a the next one let's say is a plus d the next one is a plus 2d a plus 3d like this we see that the terms if they are differing by the same common difference d that kind of data is what we are calling as uh, that sequence is what we call as arithmetic progression all the terms within that particular sequence they have the same difference. So, if the first term is A, the second term will be A plus D. The next term will be A plus 2D. Or it could be in the other way also. First term is A. The second term is A minus D. The third term is A minus 2D. Then A minus 3D. Like this, we can have the nth term as A plus N minus 1 into D or a minus n minus 1 into d, any of these. So, wherever the difference is common, whether it is positive or negative, we call it as arithmetic progression. And the nth term in this arithmetic progression is going to be a plus n minus 1 into d. Similarly, we can have some kind of a sequence where this, the difference will not be uniform, but the ratio of the terms can be uniform like this. The first term is A. The next term is multiplied by R. It is a multiplication of the earlier term by R. The same thing goes with the second term, third term, fourth term. So, the nth term becomes A into R to the power of n minus 1. So, this kind, whenever I am seeing a sequence of data which is following such a kind of pattern. So, if I am talking of 3, 3 into 2, 6, 6 into 2, 12, 12 into 2, 24, 24 into 2, 48. So, this kind of a sequence, if I see any kind of a data, I call it as a geometric progression. So, once we are looking at the data, we need to get some kind of uh, a clarity or understanding that whether it is following any kind of a pattern or not. A very common example the dividend the company has declared, let's say at the end of one year, if it is D, the present value is D by 1 plus R. At the end of two years, it becomes D by 1 plus R squared. At the end of three years, D by 1 plus R cube. At the end of uh, N years, it is 1 by 1 plus R, D by 1 plus R to the power N. Now, what I could see, this is following a geometric progression. Because the, the division of this by this, all of them are having a common ratio 1 by 1 plus R. So, we really need to understand the patterns in the data so that we can do the calculations. The most common thing is find out the summation of all these. 
So the most common application is now that we know that uh, this is the first term, this is the second term of an arithmetic progression, of a geometric progression, the major requirement is in terms of how do I do some kind of summations on that kind of a progression. Now this is where the word series comes into picture. Whenever I am doing a summation of a sequence of values, that is what we are calling as a series. So, if I really want to add a, a plus d, a plus 2d and a plus n minus 1 into d, if I really want to add all these things, this we call as sum to n terms of an arithmetic progression which works out as n by 2 times 2a plus n minus 1 into d. This becomes the sum of n term. So, probably if I have 3, 5, 7, 9 up to 83. Now, all I need to know is how many terms are this. So, first of all, I need to know what is this term number. So, I know nth term is a plus n minus 1 into d is equal to 83. a, I know the first term is 3. n minus 1 into common difference is 2. So, this is 83 n minus 1 into 2 is 80, 2n minus 2 is 80, 2n is 82, n is 41. So, the 41st term is 80. Now, that I know that this is the 41st term. If I want to simply add up 41 by 2, 2a plus n minus 1, 41 minus 1 into d. So, it becomes 41 by 2 into 42 is 80 plus 6, 86, working out to 41 times 43. So, 16, 12, 16 and uh, 1763 is the typical value for this. Now, this is what is the sum of n terms in an arithmetic progression. And a slight improved formula instead of, uh, if I say, what is the formula we have given? n by 2 into 2a plus n minus 1 into d. Now, if you just try a little bit of clarity here, I will write it as a plus a, 2a, I will write it this way, a plus n minus 1 into d. So, works out as n by 2 times a is the first term plus a plus n minus 1 into d is the last term. So, which in this case, okay, the moment I know that n is 41, I am simply taking the first term and the last term, which will give me again the same solution. So, if the data is more of an arithmetic progression, I can very well get into the addition in this way. Similarly, when I am having 3, 6, 12, 24, 48, so, if I really want to find out the sum of 20 terms, right, 3 plus 6 plus 12, so on. Let's say I want to find out the sum of the 20 terms of this. What typically comes out is the formula works out as a into r to the power of n minus 1 divided by r minus 1. It's as good as saying a is the first term which is 3 r which is the common ratio which is 2, 2 to the power of 20 minus 1 divided by 20 minus 1 which is 19. So, this number would be the summation of all those 20 terms that are typically coming over here. And in case the r is less than 1, our modulus of r is less than 1, the same formula goes slightly the reverse way. a into 1 minus r to the power of n divided by 1 minus r. It's as good as I am taking the r minus out both from the numerator and the denominator which is giving me the required result. Then, in geometric progression, there is also a possibility of sum of infinite series. And this is applicable only when the modulus of R is less than 1. So, for this, there is nothing called infinite series. 
but if I am looking at the other way, okay, 48, 24, 12, so by two kind of stuff, 6, 3, 1.5, if I am looking at a series like this, now what is my R here, R is only 1 by 2. So wherever this is the case, I can find the summation of the infinite series a, divide, a is 48 here, A by 1 minus R, R is 1 by 2. So 48 by 1 by 2 makes it 96. Sum of infinite terms of a geometric progression here works out to 96. This is how we can simplify. There are lots of applications of infinite series. We talk about uh, the uses relating to preference dividend. We talk about the uses relating to the dividends, a uh, lot of applications, the present value of the dividend, the present value of the perpetuities, lots of applications which use this concept of the geometric progression. So, understanding the nth term as well as the summation of n and infinite term is very much essential for our uh, mathematical basics. Then, we will move on to the next important concept which is again a fundamental concept dealing with exponents and logarithms. So these are the common law of indices is the very uh, textbook name which we might have gone through as a part of our uh, schooling. Right, uh, probably it's as good as saying if I have 2 cube multiplied by 2 squared I could very well go with 2 to the power of 3 plus 2. It would be same as 2 to the power of 5. Similarly, if I have to divide 2 cube by 2 squared, I could very well say it is equivalent to 2 to the power of 3 minus 2, which is 2 power 1. And if I have a requirement 2 cube to the power 2, it's as good as 2 to the power of 3 into 2 in the power, making it 2 to the power of 6. So, these are the very common laws. The moment we understand them, we have to apply them. There is nothing. Anything raised to the power of 0 is 1. Anything raised to the power of minus is nothing but 1 divided by the plus. The same number raised to the power of plus. So, 2 to the power of minus 3 is nothing but 1 by 2 to the power of 3. So, a to the power of minus m is same as 1 by a to the power of m. The same logic goes here. a to the power of minus m by n goes as first of all 1 by a to the power of m by n. Now, because it is a to the power of m by n, I could very well take it as a to the power of m to the power 1 by n. Because I, multi I can multiply these two things. So, first take the inverse, raise to the power of m and then to the power 1 by n is nothing but the nth root. So, the other way I could very well write it as the nth root of a to the power of m and take the reciprocal of that. So, these are some of the different uh, formulas you need to be comfortable with and using these formulas, how well I can apply for simplifying my uh, calculations is something which uh, needs to be comfortable with. The same logic goes with logarithms. Wherever we are using uh, an exponent, the inverse of that is what is a logarithm. So, probably if I am saying a power m, if it is some x, then what we are saying is if I want this exponent, the exponent is m. If I want this m, I am calling this as logarithm of x to the base a. That is what is the typical definition of the logarithm. Any exponent to which a base is raised to can very well be obtained by taking the logarithm of the value and taking it to the base a. It's as good as saying if I say 2 cube is equal to 8, the other way of saying is 3 is logarithm of 8 to the base 2. 10 to the power of 5 is 100,000. 
it's as good as saying 5 is equal to logarithm of 100,000 to the base 10. So that is what is the definition of logarithm. Again, we have a few rules just like the way we had uh, rules with respect to uh, uh, exponents. We also have rules with respect to logarithms. So it is like if I have log x to the base a plus log y to the base a, it is same as log xy to the base a. Simple way to work it out. Right now, let's say log x to the base a, take it as p. Then we know that x is a to the power of p. Similarly, I have log y to the base a, take it as q. Again, using the principle y is a to the power of q. Now, take xy multiply these two things or multiply yeah multiply xy if you are doing it it is nothing but a to the power of p into a to the power of q which becomes a to the power of p plus q now from here i know p plus q is nothing but log xy to the base a that is how it is coming now p is nothing but log x base a Q is nothing but log y to the base a. So it is getting replaced as log x to the base a plus log y to the base a is nothing but log xy to the base a. Now a few important rules like this log xy to the base a is same as log x to the base a plus log y to the base a. The division of the logarithms is individually the subtraction between the two logarithms you can very well go with the same approach. Then similarly, log x to the power of y base a is coming out as y into logarithm of x base a. So simple way again, x to the power of y, take it as some k. Right? Uh, or probably you take log x to the power of y base a, take it as k. So x to the power of y is a to the power of k. And uh, and x and uh, x here goes as a to the power of k to the power 1 by y comes out as a to the power of k by y right now i can very well uh, go with okay if this is a to the power of k by y that is what x is a to the power of k by y. Now you can say k by y is equal to log x to the base a. k is nothing but y into log x to the base a. So k is nothing but log x base a, log x to the power of y base a, which is working out as y into log x to the base a. So just by doing that kind of equation, equations you are able to find out different kinds of relations with respect to logarithm the most common forms of logarithms are if i am taking 10 as the base we call them as common logarithms where we use the word log and the base is 10 and the other common type of logarithm that is generally used is where the base is equal to e e is a constant which is approximately equal to 2.718 that particular value for which the slope of a power x at x equal to 0 is 1 that is called as e and uh, wherever we are expressing them as a base e we are calling them as natural logarithms and they are represented by ln lots of applications are there again with respect to ln even for finding the continuously compounded kind of returns, we'll use logarithm of S1 by S0. Logarithm has even for the uh, returns, we say that uh, the returns of any, uh, any security, it follows, uh, 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 I take the continuously compounded returns. And uh, the continuously compounded returns, I even say that they follow a kind of a normal distribution. 
so there are so many applications in the world of uh, finance which uses the continuous behavior which is expressed again in the form of logarithms so graph by is also if the graph of e power x is like continuously growing like this the logarithm which is exactly the inverse of e power x goes exactly the reverse or mirror reflection about y equal to x like the inverse always goes that way any inverse to a particular if at all i am saying y equal to e power x what is the inverse of this inverse is nothing but find x x equal to log y base e otherwise it is ln y so that is where we say f inverse of x is nothing but log x so that is how we are typically uh, arriving at the inverse inverse of uh, exponent is the logarithm and inverse of the logarithm is the exponent so one more uh, important concept that has to get into our minds then a few common expansions so we have uh, e power x we generally can expand it using this formula so if it is like if i want e squared okay i can directly find out the value but uh, in reality how i can compute it is i take it as 1 by 1 plus 1 by 2 plus 1 plus 1 by 2 squared so on this is a geometric progression so the approximation comes to a by 1 minus r so right so because e power 2 so it is coming out as 1 plus 1 by 2 plus 1 by 2 squared plus so on so a by 1 minus r comes out as 1 divided by 1 minus half which is half coming out to 2 the same logic typically goes even with log 1 plus x log 1 plus x also goes with x minus x squared by 2 plus x cube by 3 minus x power 4 by 4 this is the value that gets simplified as long as x is lying between minus 1 to plus 1 see when uh, and the other important rule or law that comes out from this is for very small values of x if x is very minute x squared by 2 is even more minute x cube by 3 is even more minute so all these things can get ignored and log 1 plus x will just get approximated equal to x it's one important rule we are using in case of daily returns versus continuous returns see if if i am saying daily return i say p1 minus p0 by p0 right if i am assuming that this is x what i am saying is log 1 plus x 1 plus p1 minus p0 by p0 which is nothing but log p0 plus p1 minus p0 divided by p0 is nothing but log p1 by p0 this is the same as p1 minus p0 by p0 provided this x is very very small and uh, in the reality space this is nothing but this we call as discrete compounding mechanism and this is called as continuous especially when the time period is much much smaller when the values of x are much much smaller i can make these kind of uh, approximations and i can very well use them for calculations as well then equations very commonly known stuff right anything that i am expressing in this particular form i can very well solve it ax plus b equal to c so ax will become c minus b and x will become c minus b by a a quick simplification and uh, there could be uh, multiple uh, unknowns x and y so these two are called as simultaneous equations and simultaneous equations uh, need to be solved for variables there are two simultaneous equations in two variables so there i can find out one single solution 
So typically just as a quick way to solve a1x plus b1y plus c1 equal to 0, a2x plus b2y plus c2 equal to 0. There are two mechanisms. One is the elimination method. So either I have to eliminate the x or y. If I have to eliminate x or y, the coefficients for both of them should be the same. So what I do here, let's say in this case I want to eliminate x. The simple thing I will do is this first equation I will multiply with a2. So it will become a1 a2x. Second equation I will multiply with a1. Then also it becomes a1 a2x. So I can very well eliminate in case I get both of them same, either with the same sign or with an opposite sign. If they are both with the same sign, I will eliminate through subtraction. If they are the same with opposite sign, I will eliminate through addition. So the first thing is becoming a1a2x plus a2b1y plus a2c1 is equal to 0. The second one is also becoming a1a2x plus a1b2y plus a1c2 equal to 0. Now I subtract these two. When I am doing the subtraction, obviously this is going off. So it becomes a2b1 minus a1b2 times y is equal to, you take it to the other side, a1c2 minus a2c1. And overall y comes out as a1c2 minus a2c1 by a2b1 minus a1b2. So this is how the y gets uh, evaluated. The same logic I can uh, use to eliminate x as well. Probably instead of multiplying this with a2, I could have multiplied this with b2. I could have multiplied this with b1, wherein uh, y's become the same and they can be eliminated through the subtraction method. That is what is the elimination method of solving the two simultaneous equations. Whereas on the other side, we also have a substitution method. a1x plus b1y plus c1 equal to 0. a2x plus b2y plus c2 equal to 0. What I will simply find out is from here, I will find out what is the value of x. So, a1x equal to minus of b1y plus c1 and x is minus of b1y plus c1 divided by a1. So, whatever the value of x that I got from the first one, I substitute it in the second one. a2 times x is minus of b1y plus c1 by a1 plus b2y plus c2 is equal to 0. Now let's simplify it. Minus a2b1y minus a2c1 plus a1b2y plus a1c2 is equal to 0. Now I will collect all the y terms. So y times a1b2 minus a2b1 is equal to a2c1 minus a1c2. And from here comes y is a2c1 minus a1c2 divided by a1b2 minus a2b1, which is the same y which we have got even in the earlier case using the elimination method. So in some cases when we are really using the numbers, in some cases the substitution method becomes more appropriate and easy to solve. In some cases the elimination method becomes more and more easy. But yes, when we start using the computer, compared these to these two methods, we find that the matrices based method is more and more easier to solve these kind of expressions. We'll try to see at a later point when we are using the matrices, we'll try to solve these kind of problems when uh, by using the mechanism of matrices also. And when it comes to the word of inequalities, they are just the same as linear. 
So if I am talking of a minus bx is less than c, only when the minus is getting transferred to the other side, the sign has to change. Right? So it is like, okay, a is less than bx plus c. But when I am trying to get the other side, right, bx plus c is greater than a, bx greater than a minus c, x greater than a minus c by b. Whenever I am trying to multiply both sides with the negative, so if you, if you just see a minus bx is less than c. Now let's say I multiply both sides with minus 1. What happens is, minus a plus bx, then I will have to put a greater than sign rather than a less than sign. So, bx is greater than a minus c, x is greater than a minus c by b. So, this is one more important uh, basic rule that we really need to remember with respect to solving the inequalities. Then, Solving the quadratic equations, any expression of the form ax squared plus bx plus c equal to 0 is what we are calling as quadratic uh, expression. And if I have to solve for the roots of this quadratic uh, equation wherein I want to find out the values of x, we are having a direct formula minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac by 2a. Now, this b squared minus 4ac is actually called as the discriminant, which actually determines the nature of the solution. If this is very much positive, we'll have two real different solutions. If this value comes out to 0, we have only one solution minus b by 2a. And if this value is negative, the square root is not defined for a negative number. So, there are no real solutions for this data. So, if I, if I let's say I have 3x squared plus 7x plus 12 equal to 0. Then all we are saying is x is minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac, 4 into 3 into 12 divided by 2a. Now you see minus 7 plus or minus square root of 49 minus 144 by 6. Now because this is a negative number, the root does not exist. No real solution exists for this data. Rather than that, I say x squared plus 7x plus 12 instead of 3x squared minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4 into 1 into 12, 48 by 2. Minus 7 plus or minus 1 by 2 works out to minus 7 plus 1 by 2, minus 3, minus 7, minus 1 by 2, minus 4. There are two real roots because b squared minus 4ac is greater than 0 and is positive. So, that's how we can uh, really work out uh, the roots of the quadratic equation using this simple solution or simple uh, roots calculation. And uh, one more important aspect which we see is the different functions and the graphs that are associated whenever we are talking about uh, the different kinds of functions and graphs. So, something taken on the x-axis and its corresponding value taken on the y-axis. e power x goes like this. Probably you just take different values of x, take different values of y and do the plotting. The same logic you can uh, go with. Uh, the same logic can very well uh, go up with log x. It would typically be a symmetric uh, to that of uh, y equal to x line. So, if this is y equal to e power x, I see that this will be y equal to log x because they both are inverse to each other. We see that they would be symmetric. Uh, they would be uh, having the mirror image, mirror reflection with respect to the line y equal to x. And we know that uh, for, a, uh, for a, a linear kind of a graph, it's a straight line. Quadratic looks like a parabola. 
the e power x graph looks like exponentially growing like this log x graph looks like growing and after that stabling out all these uh, typical shapes of the graphs is what we really need to be comfort so all these concepts will form the basic uh, framework for uh, mathematics of course there are so many things that do keep uh, coming up as we move further and further but yes a good understanding of the very basic things will help us understanding the different concepts of finance quite effectively right